it does give me great pleasure to introduce Alan. Alan Mustard, uh, he was our ex-chair of OSMF. He uh, did do the keynote uh, back in 2016 when we were here uh, before, so, uh, so he gets to do it again. In 2016 is when he actually started his uh, United States ambassadorship to Turkmenistan, sorry about that. Um, and he's also uh, got a, a few uh, incredible achievements along his career. Uh, he was the United States Department of Agriculture's Distinguished Honor Award, which is the agency's highest honor. I won't go through the list of all the other honors he got there, which, by the way, there are many. Uh, and he's also the grand, uh, grand Decoration of Merit and Gold in the Republic of Austria, the highest award for any foreigner in the country. So uh, very well uh, distinguished individual. It's, it's an absolute pleasure, pleasure to have him here. He is an active OSM community member and an active mapper. Uh, and with that, I'll give it to Alan. Is somebody controlling the slides? Ah, there we go. So it's uh, 4 o'clock in the morning in Falls Church, Virginia. And if you expect me to be able to speak off the cuff uh, extemporaneously uh, like that, uh, go get yourself another cup of coffee. Uh, I am caffeinated, but I am going to be reading from notes because otherwise I will fall asleep and forget what I'm supposed to say. Uh, before I get into the presentation, I do want to tell you a story about interacting with the US Department of Justice uh, a few years ago, back when I was uh, on the board of directors of the foundation. Uh, Justice was conducting an investigation into uh, another firm's, which will remain unnamed, alleged monopoly in the market for geospatial data. Uh, the department sent uh, us a questionnaire, uh, which I filled out as best I could, and followed up with a telephone interview from a, a, an attorney with the Department of Justice. Um, and the questions included our sales volume, which we didn't have any sales. Uh, wanted to know our organizational chart, we didn't have one, and then wanted a copy of our strategic plan. And at that point, we didn't have one of those either. And the attorney finally said, uh, you're not a normal company, are you? And I said, no, we're not a normal company. And in fact, uh, I got chewed out by some members of the, uh, of the foundation for referring to OSM as an organization. Uh, he said, it's more like a movement, like the Alice's Restaurant Anti-Massacre movement, uh, which you may have heard of. Uh, and with that, the interview ended, and the Department of Justice never called me back. So when the organizers of this conference asked me to uh, talk about what's changed since 2016, when I last spoke, uh, I thought about OSM and its status as a movement, and has that changed? And I want to talk about that. So if we could have the next slide, please. Oh, I have a control of it. My God. Which one do I punch? This one, OK. So first, let me thank you for the invitation to speak today. This is a bit of a, of a homecoming. My first foreign trip, uh, my first voyage outside the boundaries of the United States was to Belgium right out of high school. Uh, I spent a month in the summer of 1973 bumming around Europe on a student rail pass. How many people here were born before 1973? My God. That's scary. Um, anyway, the entry point was uh, Brussels Airport on a charter flight from Seattle. Spent a month bumming around Europe. So I have very fond memories of Belgium uh, dating back half a century. Uh, perhaps more important to this audience, I still possess the De Rook map of Brussels and sightseeing guide, which I bought for 35 Belgian francs. Remember those? And uh, it's part of my permanent map collection and guidebook collection. Now, more recently, I did visit in 2016 when I delivered the uh, Sodom keynote address. 
on mapping in Turkmenistan. Uh, the organizers of this conference asked me to come back this year and talk about what's changed since 2016. So I called some friends in the OSM community and asked them for their thoughts and what do you think has changed significantly since 2016. And two threads emerged. One of them was that, yeah, there have been some changes, but more important perhaps is how much has not changed. And so those are the two threads that I really want to talk about. Now, before we get into the presentation, I want to give you an atmospheric. Um, and I want to warn you, I stole an idea. Don't worry, LWG, it's not a copyrighted idea, so no need to go out and, and do anything. But I stole an idea from Mark Prielo. I asked an AI engine to generate images for the presentation. And this exercise will demonstrate to you both the potential and the shortcomings of AI. Uh, but that said, all of the commentary is mine, so if you want to throw tomatoes, throw them at me, not at ChatGPT. So, in 2016, the OSM Foundation resembled a rudderless ship. Uh, infighting within the board of directors had led to paralysis. And the board included members opposed to taking of any decisions, period. There was no reliable sense of what the community wanted uh, there had been some unstructured surveys that basically yielded data so disorganized, mostly freeform text responses, that the data were virtually unusable. At the same time, OSM was under a tremendous amount of external pressure, first from growing demand for the data that the infrastructure was beginning to struggle to handle, and second from a fortunately botched takeover attempt that the membership working group managed to obstruct. So we were under some pressure, we needed to start making decisions. And the board started making decisions in 2020. Um, over the protests of some very loud voices in the community that insisted that the only reason the board existed was to fulfill the requirements of the Companies Act 2006, which is the law in England under which we were incorporated. Um, the board conducted a very structured survey in 2021 to assess community's attitude towards some of the decisions we were making. And what we discovered was that between five and 10% of the community still opposed to making decisions, which meant that 90 to 95% of the community, at least of those surveyed, uh, had no, no objection to the board actually making decisions. And at that point, the board began to make decisions a little bit more confidently. Now, that was the major change, and that change led to a number of other changes. The chronic shortage of volunteers for maintaining hardware and software coupled with the increased demands for data led to contracting an engineer and uh, the loss of third party funding of the ID editor led to the retention of a contract for uh, software development. This, of course, had a cascade effect. We had to start raising funds to pay for those contracts. And this required a change in mentality. Because up until then, the foundation had been very, 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 very proud of being a shoestring operation, operating on a budget that was extraordinarily small. Um, and I'll make an aside. I caught, talked to some folks in the Linux Foundation at one point. They asked us what our budget was. I said, it's about 120,000 British pounds. They literally started laughing uh, at that figure. And I'll explain where their budget is in a bit. Um, that model is simply no longer viable. And this raised a question of how large OSM's contract workforce should be allowed to grow. And that in turn led to a strategic planning exercise. Um, the bottom line of the strategic plan is that we philosophically want to remain a lean, project characterized by low cost of operation and dominated by volunteers. And this is reflected in the strategic plan, but I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, now, some external influences induce some change. There are more mappers. Most of them are small contributors. Uh, the good news of this is that we get more data. Uh, the bad news is that we get more vandalism. 
And this means more work for the data working group. And in the case of the recent vandalism of Russian names, uh, a lot more work for the data working group. And you know, here's my shout out to the DWG, which does yeoman's work most of the time anyway, but in particular in that case, uh, did absolutely incredible work. The foundation has more local chapters than it did in 2016 with broader geographic reach. You know, in 2016, all local chapters were in Europe. We now have local chapters in both Americas, in uh, Africa, and in Asia. We're still not where I would like to see us in terms of the geographic reach of local chapters, but we're making progress. Um, the foundation added active membership, so you don't have to pay to belong to the foundation. You just have to map 42 days out of the year or do something the equivalent of that, and you can become a member of the foundation. This is really good for low-income countries and countries which have difficulty remitting payments to the foundation. Uh, and speaking as a volunteer moderator, updating the etiquette guidelines and introducing moderation has both made conversations more civilized and made the OSM spaces more welcoming. Uh, OSM started out as an in-your-face project, we all know that, we know the history, and that kind of corporate culture, if you will, has made us less than welcoming in certain parts of the world and with certain demographics. So uh, that started to soften a little bit, and that changes for the better for a project that aspires to create a map of the world that anybody can use. We even now have a specific policy for dealing with the very most toxic people, which are the people who do channel hopping just raising trouble wherever they can and then jumping to another channel to continue. We've only had two cases in the history of the project, but we now have a policy for dealing with them. With luck, we won't have to deal with them very often. All of these improvements are traceable back to the foundation's all-volunteer board of directors, the members of which, in my opinion, deserve a lot more praise than the mud that also often gets slung at them. So here's my shout out to the Foundation Board of Directors for making decisions, sometimes hard decisions, that result in a better project. Where did our slide go? Um, can we somehow get that picture back? I wanted you to look at that picture uh, because that is an AI generated picture and it looks pretty good at first blush, but if you look at the guy's right hand, you notice that his right hand is deformed. I don't get to show any pictures now. Why did I work so hard to get this AI to generate these pictures? You don't want to look at me, believe me. There are much better things to look at. So are we rebooting or something? All right. All right, well, I'm gonna start talking about, always have your paper back up. Okay, just as important are some of the things that have not changed. This is still a volunteer-driven project. So Meta can support RAPID, um, with its AI augmented capabilities. Amazon can pay mappers to do a lot of last mile mapping, but RAPID still needs ground truth because there's not a satellite image in the world that can tell you what the name of a street is. There's not a satellite image in the world that can tell you what's inside a building. You need somebody at street level who goes in, as I did yesterday in Bruges, noticing that Dunkin' Donuts was not on the map I added it because a satellite image cannot look down at Bruges and tell you, oh, there's a Dunkin' Donuts in that building, which is important. <laughs> Believe me. Um, and in that regard, I think the founding of Overture as a consortium of large data users has had, and I predict will continue to have, virtually no impact on OSM from the points of view of data collection, data verification, and data quality, which are the activities the foundation supports, but does not control. So we've got a picture back here. Is it gonna show up up there too? 
Still working on it. Okay. Uh, no, that's okay. Let's let's let's. They can't. They're not going to be able to see it from. It's as soon as we can get it up there. Another thing that hasn't changed is the overall trajectory of the OSM project. We have a strategic plan for the first time in the project's history. And uh, here comes the uh, truth in advertising, the disclaimer. Um, I worked on the first strategic planning exercise in 2021 and then uh, collaborated with Sarah and with uh, Craig Allen uh, in the, the, the more recent one. So I have a little bit of an insider's view as to how the strategic planning got done. Uh, the point of origin of this were the conversations that I conducted in uh, 2020, uh, talked to over 40 individuals and groups, followed by the SWOT analysis that we did across the community, and that in turn was followed by the 2021 community survey, which got over 3,000 responses, making it a very robust sample. The bottom line for the OSMF is that the strategic plan is really a codification of what the community wanted. No major radical departure from the overall trajectory. OSM is going to remain a movement with a very light, almost imperceptible administrative structure keeping the servers up and the electrical bills paid. Now, that's the good news. Now, the bad news is that there are still issues out there that we need to deal with and that changes to date have not addressed. These include such technical details as Brexit and the impact on our data licensing since we are incorporated in England, and existential issues such as continued vulnerability to a hostile takeover. Could we, I don't know how to make this thing go backward. Can we go backward to uh, the previous slide? Take a look at this guy's hand here. I mean, AI did a pretty good job on most of him, but you get to his right hand there. There's something very seriously wrong with that right hand. Okay, uh, again, showing you the limits of AI AI can do a good job up to a point, but you really do need a human being. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. Um, we still have a certain amount of vulnerability to a hostile takeover. Uh, we're still incorporated as a regular company in England when we should be incorporated somewhere, probably in the EU, as a tax deductible nonprofit. OSM US is a nonprofit in the United States. Uh, the foundation should be a nonprofit incorporated someplace, uh, like I say, probably in the EU. We're still stuck on API version 0 0.6. We remain short of volunteers and critical working groups. And our fundraising efforts are only just starting to get underway. So these are all opportunities for community members to step forward and help. And I urge all of you to think about how you can help the foundation remain robust and continue to support the OSM project. Now, this is another AI-generated issue uh, image, photo of an Asian journalist consulting an online map of Japan for the location of a shrine. Why does she have a selfie stick? Who needs a selfie stick in order to consult an online map? I don't get it. So again, nice picture, looks interesting, uh, but uh, there's something a little bit not quite right. So when I look out into the future, I see an OSM that remains pretty lean with a budget maxing out at about a million dollars or so a year, maybe a million euros. And to put that in perspective, the Linux Foundation's annual budget is about $200 million, of which $2 million is paid to Linus Torvalds as an honorarium. Steve Coast, don't get any ideas. Wikimedia's budget exceeds $150 million per year, and Wikimedia spends three times more on legal counsel alone than the OSMF currently spends in total on everything. So compared to that, a million bucks a year or a million euros a year is small potatoes. As our fundraising efforts grow legs, we'll have the financial resources we need to implement the strategic plan, which includes keeping the hardware and software platform able to meet growing demand and increasing the number of contract system administrators who can keep the infrastructure up and running. In that regard, I remind everybody that in the 2021 community survey, stability of the platform was by far the highest priority the community identified. The strategic plan addresses that. 
The foundation will also be able to support the software ecosystem with strategic investments to support data collection, data entry, and data quality control, another issue the community strongly supports. And again, one of the questions that we faced in the strategic planning exercise was, where do we draw the line? Where do we stop supporting? And the decision was, we support data collection, quality control, that upstream, but the downstream, the actual generation of cartographic products, we leave to the commercial ecosystem. We don't worry about that as the foundation. There are other opportunities to strengthen the OSM project without compromising our principles. OSM US has demonstrated the uh, value of hiring an executive director to handle day-to-day -day operations. And increased fundraising could allow the foundation to, to follow suit. Better fundraising will also allow financial support of some of the local communities that need help, including with legal fees incurred when incorporating in order to become local chapters. These are trivial costs to us here in the developed world. Uh, they are not trivial. In fact, they are oftentimes prohibitive when you're dealing with uh, the, the less developed world. We don't have the funds to do these things yet. But I ask all of you to imagine a project that is different from Wikimedia, that is different from the Linux Foundation, that operates on a budget of only about a million euros or dollars per year, not 200 million, not even 150 million, but about 1 million, and does everything we're doing now, plus a little bit more, and does it with greater stability, greater ease, and fewer headaches. Now, I asked, uh, OpenAI to draw a picture of a photorealistic picture of a woman deciding which path to take while consulting a map in the Flemish style of Rubens. Uh, my wife and I went through the uh, Fine Arts Museum, uh, looked at the Rubens paintings, and um, I didn't see a single Rubens painting that had a woman holding a cell phone to her ear. Um, so maybe I missed something, I don't know. But uh, again, this underscores, it's a nice picture. I like it, it's very pretty, but the cell phone just kind of, uh, it doesn't quite fit. So I close with this image of two cartographers drinking beer after a hard day of mapping, because I don't want you to think that OSM and the work on the OSM Foundation are or should be all hard work and drudgery. I joined this project nine years ago, not quite 10. Nine years ago because I needed it, and I've stuck with it because it's fun. The people involved in the project are great people to socialize with, drink beer with, and let's keep the movement not merely alive, but let's keep it fun. And I hope that speaking as an agricultural economist, that you will all support Belgian farmers by eating and drinking as much as you can hold during your visit to Antwerp. Thank you. Do I, have, do I have time to take questions? I'm sorry, do I have time to take questions? Okay. And I'm including them in a couple of weeks here from Spain. Thank you very much, Aaron Master, for this inspiring talk. And now, uh, thank you. Now we have a few minutes to ask, to answer some questions from uh, both of them. And we have this throwing mic, which I will throw to people. Don't worry, it's very light. I, you will not get hurt, but uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions for either of them. And um, I don't see any raised hands yet. There is one, okay. So let me, there you go. Thanks. I don't think, so. oh, it works. So Mark and Alan, both really great talks. Thank you. And uh, Overture Maps is a very inspiring project, and Opposite Map, well, as you can see, is a very inspiring, <laughs> inspiring project. What is the problem of Overture and OSMF working together? Like, we don't see this happening. Yeah, I, okay. Check, check. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, it, we are working together. I certainly uh, think that there's more opportunity for us to continue to uh, build that partnership further. Uh, but, um, but the reality is, is that what's happening right now is, I'll just tell you a little, a little interesting thing that uh, 
so the o the Overture Foundation is uh, a bunch of uh, a few executives from corporations, myself being one of them, trying to run a nonprofit. And it turns out being an executive at a corporation is not the right background and skill sets to properly run a non uh, a nonprofit. So uh, we're we're not we're it's taking us a little while. I'll be honest with you. Thankfully, with Mark and Amy joining, they've kind of created some semblance of structure and reality to what's happening in Overture. Uh, and we're we're really just trying to get those kind of first things out that are needed as a base. That's what what's what we got to get to just kind of kickstart things. Uh, but we do stay actively engaged with OSMF. Uh, we are going to continue to uh, bridge and work in closer collaboration as we get further along. Uh, but it's 100% our expectation is that we'll, that partnership will just flourish and grow uh, stronger and stronger. Is that working yet? Yeah. So from the OSMF side, uh, the door's wide open. We'd love to hear from Overture. Um, we'd love to work together on things. Um, so please do reach out, Overture. I think they turn the mic back and forth. You might just want to leave it on or something. It's a little slow. Uh, okay, next question. But by the way, we will, uh, absolutely. Uh, right now, we'll talk to Mark, but, but the reality is, is the team's just super in the weeds trying to get the first things out. Uh, it's, it, there's, no, there's no like hidden thing or anything happening. Uh, they're just trying to get that, the kind of, they're trying to get that base schema. Turns out just trying to wield that beast of the complexities of all the different tags and features that live in OSM and consolidating that down to a, a viable schema and then putting a bunch of very opinionated people all in the same room to try and like create consensus without being able to have just a strong voice in the room that says, no, we're doing it this way because nonprofits and things are consensus driven. And I'm sure OSMF understands how hard that is. It's very hard for us even more because uh, we don't know how to do it. You guys do, uh, or at least you're better uh, uh, experienced at it. So that's what's happening at the moment. We're just, we're not hiding, we're just working hard. Uh, and as we, as we pick our head up and it gets into a better state, uh, we'll certainly get engaged there. Other questions? Quiet audience, first thing in the morning. <laughs> I'm the one at the bottom of the circadian rhythm here. You guys are supposed to all be awake, right? <laughs> well, I'll hold back the questions on me to give people a bit more time. Um, hello, hello. Microphone, okay, there we go. Uh, since you talked a lot about generative AI, so the Dolly pictures and uh, there's also ChatGPT, which has been a lot on the news. Um, do you think that this can play from a mapper's perspective, because I'm just a regular mapper, um, do you think that this can play any role in mapping activities in a concrete way? So if I go out, I sit in front of my computer or I survey and I go mapping, can generative AI play some part in that? Can ChatGPT tell me something interesting and improve my process? Or do you think that there's anything to be, to be gained um, from that? Um. I'll give you an experience as a moderator. 95% um, of the work as a moderator is getting rid of the junk mail that comes into the talk lists. Uh, it has nothing to do with moderation, but we get a lot of junk mail. And when I took over as a moderator of the, of the two of the talk lists, I thought, you know, we should be able to automate some of this. And the mailman does permit you to write rules that automatically delete certain things that come in. So I had to learn something about regular expressions, which I've never had to deal with. How many of you have had to deal with regex? Okay, keep your hands up if you enjoy working with regex. No. No, okay. So I had to write some rules to auto-delete stuff, and I went to chat GPT and said, how do you write a rule using regular expressions to delete? And guess what? It actually is not bad. I mean, I had one false start, but by and large, when I asked ChatGPT to write me a regex expression that will uh, help me auto-delete something, it comes through in the clutch for me. So that has saved me a lot of time. So I think things like that, where you can 
specify an exact rule that you want to follow, it can help. And a lot of what we do in, in the geospatial world involves programming and things like that. So I think, I think that helps. Um, but in terms of generative AI for other things, um, I, I'll leave it to somebody with deeper experience than I have in that. I'll just throw in an idea for everyone so they're aware of uh, what's happening with generative AI. And uh, what's really interesting, so you hear about ChatGPT and you hear about all this AI stuff. Uh, what's really happening is a few companies are creating this foundational model and, and they're training it on a vast amount of data with like now trillions of parameters. It's massive. But what it's doing by doing that is it actually has a, f a fundamental understanding of language and the structure of language and it can predict uh, behavior. So, uh, and, and it really can predict and write things in ways that we never thought before. But what's super interesting about it is you can actually train that model very simply. So all of you can do something, it's called prompt engineering. And all it does is you take it, ChatGPT or any of these other models, and you say, uh, I want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, for example, uh, you give it, I like ice cream and say, that's a positive sentiment. I hate, uh, you know, um, I don't know, the cold, and that's a negative sentiment. And you give it like half a dozen of those examples, and then you give it data, and it'll turn around and flush through all that data and tell you which is positive or negative sentiments. And so there's an incredible opportunity for any of you to not have to understand uh, deep learning or anything else where you can actually start figuring out ways to leverage it and ways for it to grep over significant amounts of data in a very efficient and fast way. It's a, it's a significant breakthrough that's happening and that's why uh, so many people are excited about it. Thank you for your questions and your answers. Uh, it's time for a break. Um, just a quick layout, one second. A uh, quick layout for what's happening after the break. There will be a bunch of sessions in the different rooms. This room will be about hiking, biking, and trust marks. And all those sessions have 20 minutes of talk and 10 minutes of questions. So you do better get your coffee so that you get your questions going. Uh, a big applause for Mike and Alan. Yeah. <laughs>